Okay, everybody. So the last lecture of the semester, international finance, international financial system, which, which is one of the key components of international trade and one of the key preconditions for international trade. Why is that the case? Simply because different countries have different currencies. And in order to have international trade in goods and services, you have somehow to find a way of exchanging uh, different types of monies or different types of currencies that exist in different countries in order to allow for this system to work. So we will explore a couple of important uh, topics in this chapter. First, the foreign exchange market. So that's the market in which currencies are traded against each other. Dollars against euros or Japanese yens against dollars, so on. So that's called the foreign exchange market. And depending on how currencies are constituted, and what is the system, what is the, what is the nature of the money? We have two different regimes of um, exchange rates between the two different re regimes uh, of exchange between different monies, fixed exchange rates in which the price of one monetary unit in terms of another one is fixed in advance. And the second system in which you have flexible or floating exchange rates. So that means that the exchange ratio between dollar and euro, for example, changes from day to day or from week to week. It's not fixed. And we'll try to compare them different forms of flexible and fixed exchange rates. Uh, and see how they, what are their advantages and disadvantages. So first, let's start with the basics, with the trade. Couple, couple of categories. We're talking here about trade in goods and services. So this is this is still not financial market and foreign exchange. This is just the basic terminology of international trade. So stuff from from the last lecture. First category is the trade balance. So that's the value of export minus the value of imports. So we, in our macroeconomic uh, analysis, in our macroeconomic equation, remember that aggregate demand equals consumer spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus net exports. So that's the trade balance. Difference between exports and imports. So that's the first category, trade surplus. Trade surplus is a condition when, when the net export is positive, which means your exports is, are greater than imports. Trade deficit is the opposite. Imports is greater than exports. Okay, so that's the basics of trading goods and services. Now let's see how the monetary how the monetary uh, system works. Excuse me. So how the monetary regime works, how the exchange rates function to facilitate the international trade and what is the relationship between the trade balance, surplus, deficit and foreign exchange. So here is a simple model of how that works, simple model how international trade works and how money functions as an intermediary in international trade. So here you have an example of two countries, USA and Mexico, trading in goods and services. So Americans want to import stuff from Mexico and to export stuff from America and the other way around, Mexicans want to import stuff from America and to sell stuff to American consumers. So you start first with the pre-existing US demand for Mexican goods. We want to buy the tomatoes or cars or other useful goods that Mexicans produce. How is that achieved on, on an international market? If you're talking about two independent countries, so demand for Mexican goods 
is translated into demand for Mexican pesos. So Mexican country, Mexican currency. So you need to buy stuff in Mexico. You cannot pay in American dollars. You have to pay in Mexican currency. In order to get pesos, the Mexican currency, you have to offer in exchange the American currency. So this is this transaction moving from point two to point three is international exchange. International exchange market in which American currency is being traded uh, against the Mexican currency. So then you have to offer American dollars in exchange for Mexican pesos, and then you use the Mexican currency to buy the goods and then to ship them over to America and to sell them in American dollars. So that's the mechanism. It's the other way around with the Mexicans. So they want to buy stuff in America. In order to buy stuff in America, they need dollars. So demand for American goods creates demand for American currency on the part of Mexicans, and it creates then the supply of Mexican pesos. Money that they pay in order to get American dollars, then they buy American goods and import it into Mexico. So that's the basic kind of scheme of how that works. Uh, it's rather simple. So now let's see the how uh, how can we graphically show this the, the functioning of this exchange market. So you you guess it correctly if you guess that we we're going to be using the supply and demand framework. So this is exchange on which uh, dollars are traded against pesos, and we're going to assume here that that we have a demand for pesos expressed in the quantity of dollars that are, or the price of pesos, which is shown on the vertical axis in, on both graphs as a quantity of dollars that are necessary to pay for a, for a given quantity of, for one peso. And the demand curve for peso looks this way. It's a downward sloping curve that shows that the quantity of pesos that the American importers would want to buy at any given price of peso. What is the price of peso? That's the, the number of dollars that you will have to pay to get one peso. So that's the exchange rate. So at exchange rate at 8 cents per peso, Americans will buy whatever, 140 pesos. However, if exchange <coughs> if exchange rates appreciate, if dollar if the amount of dollars that you have to forego to pay in order to get one peso increases, then the lower quantity of pesos will be bought on the international exchange market. So it's just a conventional supply and demand curve. More dollars you need to pay for for one peso. Lower quantity of pesos will be bought by American would-be importers. So this is demand curve for Mexican currency. So this is this demand curve shows the decisions that American importers or <coughs> the people who own dollars who want to import stuff from Mexico, the kind of decisions that they are facing. And they are similar to all decisions that any buyer in any market is facing, by and large, the downward sloping demand curve. Again, the conventional upward sloping well-known supply curve. This is a situation facing the Mexicans. So it's quite understandable that at a lower exchange rate, so they are trading pesos for dollars. So they want as high an ex exchange rate as possible contrary to American demanders who want as low an exchange rate as possible. The sellers of peso want to have a higher exchange rate. So that means for one peso, the first situation here is that the exchange rate is at eight cent, eight dollar cents for one peso. They will sell only 60 pesos. If the exchange rate increases to 10 cents, so they can get 10 cents per, per peso, they're gonna offer more. 110. So these are the demand curve for peso in dollars 
supply curve for peso in dollars. This increase in price, the price in this graph is the exchange rate of dollar and peso. How many dollars or which fraction of a dollar you have to pay for one peso. Uh, on, the, on the horizontal axis is how many pesos will be demanded on the left hand graph and how many of them will be supplied or offered for sale or exchange on the right hand side graph. So now you, you, you can guess what is the next step. The next step is the equilibrium. So the equilibrium on the international exchange market is the point where supply of pesos equals demand for pesos. Just as in any other market, so you have this point here, the intersection of the two curves, that will be the equilibrium exchange rate, that will be the exchange rate and at which pesos is exchanged. For dollar, that means ten dollar cents for every peso, and the quantity of pesos that will be that will change hands is shown if you project this equilibrium point down to the horizontal axis, whatever that is, one hundred sixty pesos doesn't matter. So now that's the equilibrium. Again, the application of the surplus shortage analysis here. If for whatever reason the exchange rate uh, departs from that if exchange rate is for example higher than the equilibrium value then you have a, you will have a mismatch between the supply and demand the supply of pesos will be higher than the demand for it which is quite understandable then if the exchange rate is higher that means that for every peso as a mexican you can get more dollars so you want more dollars then you can buy more stuff in america so more people more pesos will be offered than the dollars that people that people want to to exchange for pesos because now you have to pay more instead of ten dollar cents you have to pay twelve dollar cents for for a single peso so fewer people will be exchanging dollars you will have a you will have a surplus of pesos so now in order to reach an equilibrium on this market the price of peso in dollars in dollar terms, you'll have to go down, which means that the exchange rate will have to, to be brought down. So we'll see what happened in, in, in a moment, or no, not in a moment, in some time, that sometimes governments try to prevent this process of re-equilibration of the exchange rates that can create some disturbances and distortions and problems in international trade. What happens with the shortage of pesos? So if the exchange rate is too low so then you will have much more people who would want to buy pesos like a lower price you move along the demand curve for pesos more americans want to buy higher demand for pesos but then the supply is shorter because you get less dollars for for a single peso fewer people will offer it in exchange so that's now a shortage of pesos that's the demand for, for it is greater than the supply and the equilibration will have to take place by a price going up by exchange rate going up so this is called this is called um flexible exchange rate so that means that the that the values of dollar and peso can change from time to time equilibrate the exchange rate is flexible which means it doesn't have to be one to three it could change in this particular case it could change depending on the move or, or the uh, shifts in the supply and demand curve for peso and for dollar you can have different equilibria if, if they print more money uh, increase the supply of pesos the equilibrium exchange rate will change if the demand for pesos increases for whatever reason the equilibrium rate the equilibrium interest rate the equilibrium exchange rate will change so this is a flexible exchange rates means that the value of currencies one against the other change from time to time sometimes very often uh, the opposite of flexible exchange rates is um, fixed exchange rates just, just let me go back here so the fixed exchange rates um, that's now less 
the case than it used to be before. The classical example of a fixed exchange rate is the gold standard. So the gold standard was a system in which gold was money. So gold is commodity money. This money that we have nowadays is the fiat money. So wherever the central bank prints, that's money. Federal Reserve now printed three trillion, five trillion dollars of of new currency, pushed it into into the into the financial system. That's new currency increasing the supply of dollars. That increases then demand for for other currencies. So this will then influence the exchange rates. So the money supply of money is wherever central banks decide it is. So it's flexible. It can increase. It can decrease. It 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 depends on the whims and decisions and infinite wisdom of central bankers. In the gold standard system, the money supply is fixed. The total quantity of gold that is used as money is the supply of money and can change only if you increase production of physical gold. So then what are currencies in the gold standard system? Currencies are just arbitrary measures, arbitrary weights of, of gold. Currencies are just di uh, different names for a certain arbitrarily chosen quantity of gold. Well, let's say that the pound sterling is a name for four grams of, of gold. An American dollar is just a name for two grams of gold. So in, in whichever currency you trade, in whichever country you buy, actually you're using gold as your money. And the exchange rate is irrelevant. It's fixed because the dollar is just a name for two grams of gold and pound sterling is, is a name for four grams of, of, of of gold, the exchange rate is always one to two. Gram cannot fluctuate in value against gram. So then the system is very simple, it's much simpler when you have a fixed exchange rate. Gold is money. The only thing that you do, you actually ship gold from one country to another. If Americans want to buy more, more stuff from Mexico, gold will be used as, as, as a currency. So that means that American importers will have to pay in gold the Mexican producers. So it doesn't matter they, whether they're paying, they will have to pay in pesos, but the exchange rate will be, will, will be fixed. So the same quantity of gold will always be used in international exchange. There is, not, there is no problem of fixing the value or fixing the exchange rates between the two currencies between the two currencies. Now, in modern system, this graph that I've shown you is a flexible exchange rate system. That's 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 a characteristic of uh, uh, fiat money in which the central banks manage the money supply and it can change, it, it can fluctuate. Now, the factors that can influence now the um, equilibrium exchange rate. Which factor influence where exactly the price of peso in terms of dollar will be? 0 0.08, 0 0.10, 0 0.12. Which factors influence that? We'll talk about two uh, fundamental factors that can influence this. There are many more, but these two are maybe the, the two most important ones. I will mention maybe in passing just another one, the third one. So these two uh, fundamental factors are difference in income growth rates, which means real income. If incomes in two countries grow at different rate, that will influence the exchange rate between the two currencies, the currencies of the two countries. And the second factor is the difference in the inflation rate which means if Americans are inflating more than Mexicans, that will affect uh, the exchange rate between the dollar and the peso in a particular way. We will see in a second in which way. So differential income growth, differential inflation rate. These are two key factors that influence the equilibrium exchange rate in the flexible regime, in the flexible exchange rate regimes regimes where currencies 
that the price of one currency changes in terms of another currency. How the growth of income changes the exchange rate. So imagine here that um, American income increases faster than the Mexican income. Or let's say, to simplify it even further, let's say that Mexican income stays fixed and American income increases. So that means that American demand, if, if the real income inc uh, increases, means that the American demand for both domestic and foreign goods will increase. People have greater income, so they will buy more goods and services, both in domestic and foreign markets. So that means that the demand for pesos will increase now. So the demand curve for pesos will increase because Americans want to import more stuff from Mexico. In order to import more stuff, real stuff from Mexico, they need more currency to buy it. Even if prices are fixed in Mexico, in order to import larger quantity of the stuff than before, they need higher quantity of Mexican currency. So now this will be shown uh, if we assume that the supply of pesos is the same. No, we assume that the, the same quantity of money exists in, in both countries. So we assume that inflation is either equal in both countries or zero in both countries. So then what's going to happen? The exchange rate will increase. So the peso will dip, appreciate, which means increase in value. You will have to pay more for, for one peso. Instead of ten dollar cents for one peso, you will have to buy to pay twelve dollar cents for a single peso. And quantity of pesos that uh, that will be exchanged will increase. So Mexicans are going to say, "Okay, if you want more pesos from us, you will have to pay a higher price." And the higher price is twelve cents. So if you give me every seller, if you give him a little bit more money he will sell you in most circumstances a few additional units of his product what is the product of mexican traders in the exchange market units of currency peso so greater amount of pesos will be bought by americans at higher price to import in america higher quantity of Mexican goods in order to satisfy their increased consumer needs that are based on their higher real income. America is growing. Imagine that America is not in a recession, but <laughs> increasing its real income. So this is what, what is going to happen on the exchange rate. This is how the growth rate of income, of real income in one country, affects the internet, the exchange rate. It appreciates. The, the target currency, target currency of the country that that you want to import from appreciates in value, you have to pay more and your currency depreciates vis-a-vis -vis that, that second currency. Okay, so that's income. Now inflation. Inflation, there are two concepts here. Uh, inflation and exchange rates and then something called purchasing power parity. Theorem. So I'll explain that. So, so these three are closely related. This is one of the key slides here. So here we are going to assume that in the United States, the inflation rate increased 10%. So the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, increased. So incomes are the same. Now we assume that incomes do not change or change to the same degree. So we, we can control for income. Let's say 3% growth rate both in Mexico and United States. But inflation rate is different. So in Mexico, it's zero for the simplicity's sake. In America, it's 10%. So how will this affect the exchange rate? Okay, so what happens when you have inflation? So that means that American domestic consumer goods get more expensive. If they get more expensive, that means if the Mexican prices have not increased in pesos, that means that imported goods become more attractive for American buyers. So they want to buy more imported goods. However, 
Now the problem is, would the Mexican sellers of pesos sell more higher quantity of pesos for a higher price? No, because the what what is happening in the same time is that American goods and services become more expensive, so it becomes less attractive for Mexican importers to buy and import stuff from America. So that means that the Mexican, in the same time that the American demand for pesos increases, you see a shift in the demand curve to the right, Mexican demand for dollars decreases. Why it decreases? Because it's American goods are more expensive. So then you have to pay to pay a higher quantity of pesos for dollars than before. So you're going to reduce your purchases of dollars. So then the supply of pesos will decrease. The demand for dollars decreases, which means that the supply of pesos decreases. So this is shown as the supply curve shift to the left. So what is the final result going to be? The final result is going to be that for the same quantity of pesos, this equilibrium point two, American importers will have to pay a higher price. So that's a higher price that they have to pay to acquire the same quantity of Mexican currency. And that's a mechanism that then allows Mexicans to buy the same quantity of real goods and services in America as before. This is called the purchasing power parity adjustment. So it means that they are not interested in having the same quantity of dollars. They're interested in having the quantity of dollars that will allow them the same purchasing power, the same quantity of goods and services that they can buy for that, for that uh, quantity of dollars. So if American prices increase, the exchange rate between the dollar and peso will increase. So then for the same quantity of pesos here, you could get more dollars in order to adjust, in order to compensate you for higher American prices. So for the same quantities of pesos, you will have higher quantity of dollars and you will, you will then buy for the same quantity of your domestic currency, the same quantity of American goods and import. So this is the purchasing power parity adjustment. That, that, that means when American domestic prices increase, then the exchange rate between the American currency and let's say Mexican currency will change by dollar depreciating, which means you have to pay more for the peso and peso appreciating, increasing in value. So that's the purchasing that's called in international trade theory. So you can remember that you'll have that on the final exam for certain. Purchasing power parity adjustment is an adjustment in the exchange rate between the two currencies if one country inflates more than the other country. And that's an adjustment whereby the exchange rate of the current of the country that is uh, the exchange rate of the currency of a country that inflates will depreciate in order to maintain the purchasing power of foreign currency in America allowing Mexicans to buy the same quantity of goods and services in America. So that's the principle of purchasing power parity. Also, change in real interest rates. So not nominal interest rates, but interest rates controlled for inflation. So this could influence the exchange rate because the country that has a lower real interest rate will attract more capital. So then if American interest rate, real interest rate that you have to pay for investment decreases, 
then Mexicans will be buying more, the Mexican investors would want to buy more stocks and bonds in America. And to invest in American corporations because the costs of borrowing money are lower and then investment is greater. So the, all other things being equal, the, the rate of return in America is going to be higher. So then they will, the demand for American dollars will increase. So then the Mexicans would want to buy more dollars. So this will then lead to the appreciation of the value of dollar. So the lower real interest rate in any given country means the higher value of domestic currency, the appreciation of domestic currency, because of a simple fact that foreigners would want to buy more of your currency in order to invest in your country. Lower real interest rates make your domestic investment more attractive. In order to invest, they cannot invest directly in pesos. They have to exchange their pesos and yens and euros for dollars. So that this increases demand for dollars and then increases the price in terms of foreign currencies. So this then benefits the American importers who can get higher quantity of pesos and yens and euros and buy higher quantity of imported goods in exchange for, for for the same quantity of dollars. So it's it's a smart policy if you can bring the in, real interest rate down, but the real interest rate, not the nominal interest rate, after inflation, then you're doing a good job for your economy. Whereas you're not doing a pretty good job if you if you inflate here. Because what, what happens when you when you inflate the exchange rate increases so you're gonna benefit domestic domestic uh, exporters here and you're gonna you're gonna hurt domestic importers people who have to pa to pay higher quantity of dollars for foreign currency the import the imports will be discouraged So with inflation, you're targeting two groups, domestic customers who have to pay higher domestic prices. So we already know that inflation is a, is a hidden form of taxation. So people with the same nominal incomes having lower purchasing power means they can buy less goods and services. So that's one damage of inflation. The second damage of inflation, less imported goods than otherwise would have been the case. Why? Because the interest, the exchange rate is higher. To, to get the same quantity of pesos, you you will have to pay higher amount of dollars. So the only group that benefits are exporters, people who sell to foreigners, people who who make goods for exports, who then sell to to the Mexicans and others. So two groups. So th that's why, for example, g the governments always want to, w whenever they're worried about trade imbalance, whenever they want to, to artificially increase exports and reduce imports, uh, debasing the currency, decreasing the value of domestic currency is one of the first things that they do through inflation or through other, through other means, usually through inflation. So inflation stimulates the exports and this stimulates or disincentivizes or decreases imports and also invisibly taxes the domestic consumers. So they number one have to pay higher prices for domestic goods. Number two they have to pay a higher or the same prices for lower quantity of foreign goods because now American importers can afford only a lower quantity of to buy only a lower quantity of pesos than before because the pesos the peso currency is more expensive so you have a lower quantity of imported goods so this is important to bear in mind important context here to bear in mind that inflation leads to depreciation of value of domestic currency depreciation of value of domestic currency hurts importers and helps exporters and any inflation hurts consumers period in two ways by 
reducing purchases of domestic good, goods through reducing the purchasing power of money. And number two reduces the benefits, reduces the uh, economic welfare of consumers by reducing the supply of foreign goods. So that's not the case when the when real interest rate goes down. That's good. That means that you have more capital goods or a better business climate, that the risks of loans are lower, then your labor force and, and, and uh, capital goods are more productive, that your business investment climate is better, so then the people are ready to give you the money and ask lower lower interest rate because they are secure that, that the economic system is stable and advancing so that leads to a drop in real interest rates so typically the real interest rates in in well-run countries as, as western countries are much lower than in countries like russia and china or eastern european countries or africa and so on exactly because of the lower level of systematic risks and better better uh, regulation and and uh, uh, legislation and better business climate in general Okay. So fixed exchange rates, so I already told you about that. Uh, fixed exchange rates are typically uh, exist in the commodity money system, but sometimes even they could work. There are some monetary regimes like currency board or pegged interest rates in which the governments try to fix the exchange rates of fiat currencies. Currencies managed by central by central uh, governments by central banks i'm sorry so this is the situation you have supply and demand still operate but then they can fix it at the equilibrium level which makes the entire exercise unnecessary or they can fix it at a higher or lower level so what Typically, governments want to do, as I explained you before, here, they want to keep it as high as possible. So that means they want to create a situation in which domestic currency is overvalued. Let's say that Americans, that we are talking about American currency, so they want to set up the exchange rate in such a way as to uh, decrease the value of dollar vis-a-vis -vis peso. So this will create a situation in which you have a surplus of peso. So the demand for peso will be lower because you have to pay a higher price and the supply of peso will be, will be higher. So then we, we say that dollar the dollar is here undervalued vis-a-vis -vis peso. And if the exchange rate is set at a lower point than the equilibrium point, then we say that it's overvalued, which means that the supply is not enough to meet the demand for dollars. So when exchange rate is lower, much more people would want to buy peso but much fewer people would want to sell it. So there will be a mismatch, there will be this shortfall in pesos to satisfy higher demand of, for do, uh, higher demand in dollar terms. So now what is the problem with over, overvaluation or undervaluation of dollar? So the problem is that that influences international trade. If your currency is systematically overvalued, that means that your imports will be uh, higher than your exports. If the currency is overvalued, then much more, you will have much greater demand for peso 
and people will be much more motivated to buy foreign currency and import goods from from abroad than to buy domestic goods and services. So the overvaluation of the uh, the overvaluation of of a currency creates an increased uh, demand for foreign goods, whereas the undervaluation of the currency creates increased demand for domestic goods. So overvaluation means that you have to pay less for peso, so then the demand will increase and people will, will want to buy more peso, and the undervaluation means that you have to pay you have to pay more. So the situation is that the most governments want to keep their currency at as low level as possible in order to, especially when they want to fix the trade balance. So that's one of the um, one of the criticisms, one of the attacks on the Chinese government is that they are they are artificially make American exports in China difficult and stimulate the Chinese exports to America by keeping the value of their currency artificially low. So that means it makes it for Chinese for Chinese uh, importers uh, very unattractive to buy American dollars because you have to pay higher prices so your currency is undervalued. So then it makes it more attractive for them to buy domestic goods rather than to buy dollars and they then with dollars American goods and to import them. So then undervaluation of domestic currency means that you will likely have a trade surplus. So that's the, the these are the pairs of characteristics. Undervaluation of currency means trade surplus. The overvaluation means trade. Uh, overvaluation means trade uh, deficit. Undervaluation means trade surplus. So now America has a trade deficit because American dollar is artificially overvalued or artific has an artificially high value vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese yen because the Chinese are manipulating their currency, which means decreasing its value. <clears throat> so now the governments want to do these things. The governments want to, uh, to, to debase their currency essentially in order to increase the exports because that's politically popular. So you stimulate domestic industries, you believe that you're doing something good for your economy, but what you're doing in the long run is undermining, undermining its health. So that's a kind of weird race in which Chinese are doing a thing that is bad for their economy, and Americans are bitterly protesting against that and want to prevent them from continuing doing it. No, you cannot undervalue your currency, it's the fact that you are punishing your own uh, consumers, your own customers, that you are punishing your own citizens and decrease their economic wealth. But we want to we, we want we want to let you do that because we equally badly understand economics. So so we we want to level the playing field. So from a standpoint of American customers, there is no problem at all. From the standpoint of American customers, they have a greater supply of Chinese goods. If Chinese currency is undervalued, greater supply of Chinese goods at the same price. Better supply the American market. So the real, the the only the only group in America who who is um, suffering as a consequence of that are American exporters. And then why the interests of American exporters would be more important than the interests of American importers and American consumers together. 
So that's a question that everybody has to answer. Our government that, that is complaining against the Chinese currency manipulation. The main reason for that is that we as, as consumers are not well organized. We are not a powerful lobby group and the importers are much weaker uh, lobby group than the export oriented industries. So the reason why the governments are freaking out about Chinese currency manipulation is that they are under the sway and under the influence of export lobbies. So there is no American public interest in preventing China from undercutting its own currency. The only people in America who have vested interest in that are American exporters who are hurt by by the named manipulations, currency manipulations. The, the, the great bulk of American society benefits from that. So don't, don't let anyone deceive you about that next time you hear about the scourge of, of Chinese currency manipulation. Bear in mind that it's just a propaganda of export-oriented industries. For you as a customer, it doesn't matter one bit. You as a customer are better off as a consequence of that. And a large part of import industries are also better off because they can buy a greater quantity of yuans in China or yens in Japan and buy cheaper stuff over there and sell more and profit more. So they profit, you profit as buyers, the only group that is hurt are exporters. Why would exporters need to export? They may, they can, they may sell here. Or if they cannot sell here, then maybe they should decrease their employment. Why, why the exporters always have to benefit more than everybody else? So that's one difficult question. That So you have to bear in mind this political economy angle here. This is not just a positive analysis. The positive analysis, economic science says, consumers benefit from foreign, um, foreign trade deficit. Uh, import industries benefit from foreign trade deficit. Only the exporter, export-oriented industry is suffering. And there is one more benefit here. One thing that I haven't mentioned thus far is domestic investment benefits from foreign trade. So one of the things that, that is not mentioned here uh, is imagine for a moment that America has a deficit in trade with China. That means that Americans are buying Chinese less Chinese goods than the, uh, than the uh, Americans are selling less goods to the Chinese than they are buying from them. So what does that mean? That means that Americans will be exchanging less dollars for for yens than the Chinese will be exchanging for dollars. So Americans buy one trillion dollars worth of Chinese goods in yens, and Chinese buy only five hundred billion dollars of value in America. So there is this gap of five hundred billion dollars. So there is a five hundred billion dollars of surplus dollars that Chinese keep in their hands. What are they going to do with these five hundred billion dollars? So they're not going to bury them in the ground, or to to burn them they're going to try and buy something else in America. So they, they will not buy Amer American manufacturing goods or consumer goods because they are arguably more expensive than in China or elsewhere in the world. But they will need these dollars. Then they, they will have to do something with these dollars. They may not want to buy anything else in, in, in America. So they will try then to sell dollars to somebody else. Somebody else will buy dollars. This person who buys dollars may then want to to buy something in America. That's the, the only reason why would you buy on international exchange market? Why would you buy dollars from the Chinese? The only reason you might have for that is that you want to buy something in America. So then this trade deficit with China will result finally in a trade surplus with, with a third country. If let's say Brazilians, that is $500 billion or bought by Brazilians the, to the last penny. Everything is bought by Brazilians. So what Brazilians can do, why would Brazilians buy 500 billion worth of American dollars? They can buy American goods. That's one thing. 
So then we have trade deficit with China is now converted into trade surplus with Brazil. So if $500 billion worth of goods, additional goods that American export industry can export to Brazil. Or if they don't want to, if they also don't want to buy American goods because they're too expensive, what else they can buy? They can buy stocks, bonds, real estate, and so on. So investment goods, capital goods in, yeah, in America. So who benefits from that? Who benefits from Brazilians or Chinese or Japanese buying stocks and bonds? Every one of us. If they buy corporate stocks and bonds, that means that they fund private investment in America. Higher private investment in American firms means higher rates of return for American investors, more higher wages and more employment for American workers. So it's it's good for every one of us. If they if they buy government bonds, as they often buy, you know that the Chinese and Japanese are biggest creditors of our federal government, that means that they're funding American military, a navy, and all other budget expenditures of the federal government. So you see the beauty of financial and economic globalization that actually American trade deficit with China is indirectly funding the American military that fights against China or tries to keep China in check. To the degree that the Chinese extra dollars that they are not going to spend on American goods are going to be spent on buying American government bonds that will give cash to American government to run its budget programs, including the military. So you see how things are much more complicated and how protectionism usually is not a good, is not a good way to address the problem of trade deficit. So actually there is no problem with the trade deficit. So it could exist if there is a fixed exchange rate and then overvalued, uh, overvalued dollar, then you can decide to do what our, our government in its infinite wisdom tried to do by imposing higher tariffs on Chinese goods. That's a monumental folly. That's a monumental idiocy that undermines the Chinese economic welfare, but more importantly, the economic welfare of, of Americans. So by reducing the imports, it hurts the consumer who has to pay higher prices now, and it hurts the entire supply chain of producing stuff in America. When you tax the Chinese or Brazilian steel or aluminum, you're now increasing the prices of component in, components for many industries like the cars and machinery and high-rise real estate construction and so on. So then the American customer is, is, is hurt twice or thrice. First, by directly consumer goods that directly come to America, you have to pay higher prices. Then you have to pay higher prices for the goods that use the imported components in their production processes like steel in the car industry and tractor industry and finally by lower employment in these in these industries so you have a higher employment in in tariff protected industries the steel industry for example but then you have a lower employment in automobile industry or construction industry because the steel that they have to buy in order to produce is more expensive too, so they can produce less. So that's the that's one of the reasons why international trade policy cannot work. International trade policy of a protectionist kind cannot work. That's the last thing for this lecture is whether fixed exchange rate is better or a flexible exchange rate. So any kind of fixed exchange rate, the, the, the main argument for a fixed exchange rate is that it allows for a greater degree of predictability. It reduces uncertainty. If you have a gold standard in which you know that one dollar is worth 0.5 pounds sterling, you can plan and invest and buy stuff for two, three, four years, you are not exposed to interest rate risk. That's one technical term in international finances. Interest rate risk, there's a risk that the exchange rate will change in a way that will devalue your investment. If you are, for example, importer, that the exchange rate will change in such a way as to decrease the value, to decrease the value of target currency, currency in the target country from which you wanna buy 
on a long-term basis. So this interest rate risk is is uh, exchange rate risk. I'm sorry, it's a late in the day again. So the exchange rate risk is eliminated because it's fixed forever. So you can plan for a much longer period of time. You don't have to lose sleep over over the international exchange market. So that that that's the main benefits. Uh, flexible exchange rates. If you wanna do trade policies like influencing the uh, trade balance between the two countries and so on, then the flexible exchange rate allows you to allows you to much easier manipulate much easier manipulation of the of the value of your currency. So if you consider the trade policy a positive good, if you consider the undervaluation or overvaluation of your currency for policy purposes something that you want to do, so then the flexible exchange rate is a, is a better solution for you. So you can increase or decrease the money supply and prices. So that's one avenue or the interest rates and influence the international exchange market in that way, increase or decrease the, the exchange rate between your currency and another currency. And the current system, so this is, this is the pure fixed exchange rate, that you allow the prices of different currencies against each other to fluctuate freely. You, you don't try to intervene in any shape or form whatsoever. But the problem is that most modern currencies are something that is a combination of a con partial controls and for the most part um, floating. So the ex uh, flexible exchange rates are called sometimes the floating exchange rates. So they're not, for the, for the most part, they're not always freely floating. They're floating in a limited fashion. It's called sometimes dirty floating or managed floating. So that means that floating within a certain range. So you allow it to float with a certain range, 10, 15, 20%. If it goes outside uh, the, these bounds that the central bank uh, prescribes, then you intervene through monetary policy to bring it back within this within this corridor, as they call it. So it's called the dirty floating. It's not a free floating, but but the managed, managed floating. Okay, optimal currency area, I'm going to skip that. So that's not very important. So that would be all that you need for the international financial uh, market. Uh, again, I repeat, if you have any questions, this is the last chapter that you need, that you will need for the final exam. Uh, if you have any questions and if you need any further help or systems or clarification of anything, any of these chapters, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 21, 22. So that's the material for the, for the final exam. So I will post right now this um, PowerPoint for the last 22nd chapter. And then the final exam is, I, I don't know, I told you, I've sent you an announcement that the exam will be on Saturday. But since the last day of the exams is uh, um, Thursday, so then I will reschedule the exam for for Thursday. So technically, I'm I'm not allowed to go beyond that. So it has to be Thursday. So throughout th Thursday throughout the day, so 24 hours window for you to take the final exam. Okay. So bye bye for now, and uh, see you again in virtual space space if you have. Any questions?